Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Good evening and welcome to tonight's program with Inforum and the Commonwealth Club of San Francisco. My name is Laura Bazelon and I'm a law professor at the University of San Francisco. I direct the criminal and juvenile and racial justice clinics. And tonight it is a huge honor for me to be in conversation with retired judge LaDoris Cordell about her new book, Her Honor, What's broken, excuse me, what works? Let's start with the good. What works, what's broken, and how to fix it? In our conversation, we are going to talk about her career as a steadfast and powerful advocate of LGBTQ rights, of police accountability, and elevating BIPOC communities. She's going to draw on stories that are heartwarming, some of them are painful, detailing her life on the bench, and about the system, good and flawed, that she says can and must work for all of us. So if you'd like to ask a question during the program, there is a card on your seat if you are with us in person. And for you online listeners, you can contribute too by dropping a question in the chat, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, okay, so Judge Cordell, Ladoris, you were famously the first woman African American to be appointed to the bench in Northern California. So this was a history making appointment. Even today, however, I think when we look across state court benches, both inside and outside of the state, we see a composition of judges that doesn't necessarily reflect the people who are often before the court. Some of my law students at a majority minority, majority female law school don't necessarily see themselves becoming judges, and yet I think quite a few of them would make excellent judges. What do you say to women and to minorities who don't feel like they, quote, look or are properly credentialed to be a judge? First, Laura, thank you so much for spending time with me, and thank all of you and those of you who are live streaming. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be here, and it's really awkward because I'm usually sitting in that chair interviewing a whole bunch of people for the Commonwealth Club. So uh, thank you, but I couldn't think of a better person with whom to spend some time than with you, Laura. Thank you. Uh, so to answer your question, the judiciary, and I'm talking primarily now about the state court judiciary, is a work in progress. Uh, it gets really high marks and then sometimes not so high marks. And by that I mean when Jerry Brown was governor the first time, uh, and this was in the early 1980s, he, he literally revolutionized the judiciary in California. Uh, he appointed more women, people of color, uh, the people from the LGBTQ communities than any governors before him and really since. Uh, Gavin Newsom is doing a very good job. But there are times when we get more conservative governors in who are responsible primarily for, I'm just talking California now, uh, for appointing judges to the judiciary. And um, not so many in terms of the, the kind of representational diversity that I think should be on the bench. So to law students, I say to them, the judiciary is something you absolutely can aspire to. Um, there's a lot of politics involved, unfortunately, so it's not strictly merit-based, and I don't think very much in life is, actually. Um, so it, it's a, it is an option, and those uh, law students can, there are many options when you go into the law. I mean, you can teach, as you do. Uh, I was a litigator for a while. You can work on policy issues. So the fact that there may not be as much representation as we want doesn't mean that it isn't something that you should strive for. Well, I'm glad that you brought up the non-linear nature of bench diversification because there's a lot of humor in this book. And one of my favorite parts is the story of how after you 
won and ran, uh, ran and won and were elected. This is after your appointment. And then you, you had an election, you won. The Republican governor at the time, Governor Duke Mason, did not want to seat you early, which he did for others so that you could get started with this calendar. And you described the back and forth this way. When asked why he wasn't going to do that, the governor said, quote, I didn't want Cordell to be able to tout herself as a Duke Mason appointee. You responded, <laughs> at last, the governor and I have something in common. It would be a source of great embarrassment for both of us if I were to be known as a Duke Mason appointee. Isn't that good? That's a very good response, I thought. That, that shut him up. It did. So my question is, are judges funnier than we think they are? Uh, I guess it depends. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't think any, any of us in any profession should take ourselves too seriously. Be you a law professor, be you... You know, in any profession at all. Um, it's important, I think, not to be just overcome with earnestness. And particularly if you're a trial court judge, uh, there's so much of life that plays out in the courtroom. Uh, you have to have a heart of stone not to laugh. So there were times when, um, yes, I chuckled quietly. I try to remain poker face, but my thought bubble sometimes was going crazy. Uh, and there were times, though, that were very hard, where I felt that this was just the worst job in the world. So it it's just really runs the gamut of the human experience that plays out in our trial courts. And, and I wrote this book about state trial court judges, because we're on the front lines. We're the people's court. We're the first ones you come to for just about everything. So everything from traffic tickets to evictions uh, to... Um, just criminal cases, civil cases, probate, adoptions, name changes, conservatorships, and that's been recently in the news, um, as well as on the mental health side, because it is trial court judges, state court judges who decide if people who are confined to locked psychiatric units can get out. We decide on their freedom. So there are a panoply of things that come before state trial court judges which is one of, the reason I wrote, one of the reasons I wrote this book, so that people could have a better understanding of our legal system, especially from the viewpoint of a judge. Yeah, I think one thing also that people don't necessarily understand about judges is that they're three-dimensional human beings like everybody else. I certainly have a hard time humanizing them, although I'm doing a better job with you, Good. when I know people only as a, a judge, so I didn't know them before, mm -hmm. I'm almost, it's very, very difficult for me to call them by their first name. It's very difficult for me to, to, to divorce them from the robe and the position on the dais. But the truth is, judges lead very interesting lives. And, and one of the things that I loved about this book was we get to know you as a human being, including as an artist, and you are a wonderful artist, and in particular, you like to draw cartoons. Not every moment on the bench is, is, is scintillating. And actually, I find that, you know, doodling helps you pay attention because you're kind of doing something with your hands as you're listening. In any event, you've created some pretty amazing cartoons, but they got you into trouble. Yes, they did. So what happened? So there's a chapter in the book called, uh, let's see, that one is called, I'm trying to think of it's Bad Judges or not. Um, yeah, it's bad judges. Uh, the disciplinary system that exists for judges. And in fact, in the appendix, you will find a listing of every single state and the District of Columbia. And there's a link. So you can click it and then find out what the disciplinary system is in any particular state and what judges by their names and their conduct, what they did that was wrong and what the discipline was. Um, so I write about myself and my own experience. And, and you're right, I did a lot of doodling uh, because sometimes the court proceedings can be very boring. I mean, if you've had your umpteenth case, you're doing your, your drunk driving case, I know what's going to play out. And it's the jurors that have to decide. So I can kind of half listen. I'm listening, uh, but I'm also doodling. And um, so what I ended up doing was drawing some cartoons 
and I have to go back. The cartooning really started when I was a little kid. I just always liked to draw and did a lot of drawings on the sidewalk chalk, all kinds of stuff. So I decided that the legal system was, a, was really ripe for cartooning, uh, that there are these legal terms, there are a lot of them, and I thought, why don't I put them on and illustrate them? So um, that's what I did. And I ended up, and there, you know, did them in color, and I ended up thinking that maybe they could benefit people. So I approached a nonprofit, which uh, represents young people, and said, why don't I give you 12 cartoons, and you can put them into a calendar, and you can sell them as a calendar. And they loved it, and indeed used the cartoons and sold them as calendars and made a lot of money for the nonprofit. I got into trouble, why? Golf. <laughs> Golf. So I drew some cartoons, and this may have been the second year that I produced the second calendar. I drew cartoons of judges golfing, because sometimes they play golf. Um, and um, so there was a complaint lodged with the Commission on Judicial Performance, and that is the body that disciplines judges in California. And I was stunned to receive a letter saying, you have to respond to this complaint, and you're in trouble because you drew some cartoons that made fun of some judges. I was stunned. I mean, First Amendment, satire, um, Daumier, Charles Bragg. I mean, these are all, I mean, it's satire. So I had to defend myself, and I had to hire a lawyer. Um, I had to respond, and uh, did I get disciplined for drawing some cartoons? Well, the answer's in the book. Um, <laughs> I'll leave you there. And uh, so anyway, it was, it was quite an experience, and... Uh, I would be very curious to how you all receive it when you, when you read that chapter. I want to stay on the topic for a minute because you also devote part of the book to things that are, are broken, that's in the subtitle, and one of the things that you say is broken is the system of discipline for judges. Your case aside, what are some reforms that you think would make that system more functional? Uh, the, the basic issue is transparency. Most people have no idea how judges are disciplined, and if they even know how, they don't know what the discipline is or what the judges have done. So in this book, I took a look at every single state to see what the systems were, and they vary uh, from state to state with regard to transparency. Um, so, and what I also found that there may be a lot of complaints against judges, and we can start, say, in California, but very few tend to be disciplined. So people are aware of this now. People in the community are saying, you know, we need to do better. Uh, I believe that disciplinary hearings should be made avail open to the public. They can be live streamed. I believe there should be transparency. Um, and th in that way, the judiciary gets held accountable. And when there is no accountability, there is no trust. And when there is no trust, our judiciary is of no use to anyone. We feel like we don't have a stake in it. So um, those are just you know, some of the things with regard to judicial disciplinary system that I'm concerned about. And we're going to leave the outcome of your particular case a mystery because it's in the book. I want to back up for a second and talk about the story behind the book. How did it come to exist? This book came about and is only here because of my parents um, who are no longer here. So I've dedicated the book to their memory in memory of them. And um, so the last eight years that I was on the bench, and I can't really recall why I started doing this, but I wrote letters to my parents every Friday for eight years. And what I would write in the letters, I would write everything that happened that week. And not only what happened, the specific cases, the decisions I made, but also how I felt. So for example, when I wrote that I had to give someone, had to give someone a life sentence, which I really didn't feel good about, I wrote about it. And I wrote to my parents and was very open about it. Uh, they have, were always uh, some of my greatest, two of my greatest supporters. Um, so I retired from the bench. And then when I went back east and I grew up just outside of Philadelphia, my mother one day pulls a box out of a closet. And my mother was a very organized person and she said, what do you want me to do with all of these? And I looked, my mother had saved every single letter. So understand, these weren't emails. I'm talking letters, like real letters, right? Um, and she had saved all the letters. So I boxed them up and uh, mailed them back here. So I came back and it took me 
a couple of years before I decided that I really wanted to read them and take a look at them. And when I read them, I was just stunned. I was stunned by how many cases I had presided over and how I had expressed what I felt about all these. And, and so that's when the idea just was kind of lying there a little bit, saying, well, maybe one day, maybe they might be fodder for a book. So eventually, it happened. It's amazing. Yeah. I love that story. I have a question about recalls, because recalls are very much in the news these days. And you took a stand a few years ago that I thought, well, it inspired me actually personally to also be public in my opposition to this, but you took a stand against the recall of Judge Aaron Persky. And this was a controversial situation. It was a controversial case that, that sparked the recall initiative. And so I guess I'd just like you to kind of give folks in the audience some background for how this came to be and then why you felt that it was important for you to take the position that you took quite publicly and what values you were trying to articulate. It's a compound question. I know. Um, in the book, there's a chapter called J'accuse. And I write about Aaron Persky and the recall. Um, because at the time, judges could not speak out and defend themselves when decisions they had made were attacked, I ended up being one of his surrogates and ended up being maybe a primary surrogate in speaking out for him. Um, so just understand, at the time, judges had no right of self-defense, none. And what struck me about that is that if you're charged or accused of murder, you have a right to defend yourself, to speak out and self-defense. Judges, no defense at all when you are attacked, when your decisions are um, questioned, none. That rule has been changed recently, really as a result of the recall, so that judges can now, uh, in narrow circumstances actually speak out, and I'm talking about in California. So um, the attack on Judge Persky was as a result of his making a decision that was controversial. He sentenced um, a Stanford freshman, and the sentence was one that people took issue with, not everyone, but a lot of people were very vocal about it, saying that sentence was too light. It should have been a heavier sentence. And as a result of that, this judge was targeted for a recall, and in fact, was recalled. My concern is that when a judge makes a lawful decision, albeit controversial, but a lawful decision follows the rules of law, uh, all the rules that apply, for example, in sentencing, that judge should never be subject to a recall because when that happens, it is a threat to judicial independence. So judicial independence basically means this. You want, picture yourself going in a courtroom, you want a judge to listen to everything, not doodle, listen. And you want that judge to then consider the facts, the law, and to make a decision. And to make that decision without looking around and thinking, hmm, I wonder what people are going to think if I make this. Or maybe that this is going to be something that's controversial and I shouldn't. You don't want that. We should never want that. So an independent judiciary is just that. It doesn't go with the public win or judge you know, licking the finger and putting the finger to the wind to see which way it's blowing. We don't want that. The reason we don't want it is that if we don't have an independent judiciary, we don't have a democracy. There are three prongs to our democracy, the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary, and none of them can fail. So my concern in speaking out was that this recall was a threat to judicial independence because this judge made a lawful decision. Uh, and so that's what we judges do. We make decisions and not everybody's happy. Some people disagree. So in the book, I write about that. And um, I will tell you, I mean, I caught hell. I got trolled and there are all kinds of things that happen. Uh, but it was important that those of us who stood together, and there were a small group of us who formed the opposition to the recall, to speak out. Now, what concerned me so much, I mean, I'm dealing in, in this was a county, Santa Clara County, judicial uh, uh, recall. So we're in Silicon Valley, where we all think that's a very educated electorate, right? Well, what I found was that when I would go out, and those of us who were on our team together would go out and talk about judicial independence, we'd get responses like, what's that? Or that's just an excuse for judges circling the wagons. And I, I was just stunned by it. So 
I write about this in the book because it's very, very important that we get it right. So recalls in California are in the Constitution. I have a chapter in the book here called The Fix, where I suggest 10 things that we can do to, to, to make the system better, to, to, to fix the things that are broken. And one of the fixes I recommend is that every state that has the the recall of judges, because not every state does, but every state that allows it. I proposed that you can have judicial recalls. I mean, judges should be held accountable, but only, only should be applied when judges have engaged in misconduct, malfeasance, or have been uh, convicted of a serious crime, but not when a judge does his or her job and applies the law using discretion, to do what the judge believes is right. So there are two states, and it might shock you as to what these two states are, that indeed have that requirement, that there cannot be a recall unless the judge has really messed up, meaning misconduct, malfeasance, committed a crime. And those two states, Georgia and Montana. And I recommend that every state that has judicial recall should follow that example. I want to stay on this for a second because, as I said, recalls are very much in the air in California and very much in the news. And, I mean, one thing that always, you know, occurs to me about situations like this is people say, well, we had an election and I'm entitled to a judge who's going to basically sort of follow my values. And, and what happens as a result of that, I think, sometimes in this particular case with Judge Persky and then... The prior recall was all the way back when Jerry Brown was governor the first time, and three justices were recalled from the Supreme Court, kind of for the same reason. It was that they weren't being punitive enough. They were overturning too many death sentences. And a lot of times what voters think is, I'm electing you essentially to carry out my will, and that is to be punitive. And one of the things that worries me, and I'm curious to know what you think about this, is since the recall of Judge Persky, is the Persky effect, the downstream effect, going to make judges more um, carcerally minded because that just seems like the safest thing. In other words, you can almost only get into trouble when you're merciful towards someone that people have a hard time identifying with. And so it's going to kind of close that, that valve and basically tell risk averse judges to steer clear of showing any kind of mercy. And that's exactly what is happening. So as a result of the recall of, of Judge Persky, throughout the country, there have been these you know, these waves going out that say to judges, you better be careful. You better think about the decisions you make, even if it's lawful, even if you believe it's the right thing to do. And it's very disconcerting and very con concerning. So you won't find a judge who's the subject of a recall for being overly punitive. You're never going to find a judge is giving out life sentences, 20. No one talks about recall. But let a judge show some compassion, some mercy, and maybe give a sentence that you just, you know, it's just not harsh enough, which is really what happened with Aaron Persky. Then all of a sudden, there's the recall happening. Uh, so, you know, my, my concern is that, that the biggest threat to the judiciary is just that. And we need to stand up and protect our judges. So you mentioned about values. You know, that judge isn't, you know, promoting my values. So people sometimes get mixed up. And I write about this in the book. Judges are not politicians. So judges, state trial court judges and state appellate judges, all the way up to Supreme Court, stand for election, either contested elections or retention elections, as do politicians, right? So people say, well, they're just politicians. And what do we say to politicians? Politicians, people run for office because they make promises. They tell you, you elect me, I'm going to do A, B, C, and D. So give me your money so I can get elected. Judges are not politicians. Any judge who runs for office and, and makes promises and says, well, I'm always going to rule in favor of business, we are in a big problem here if that were to happen. So we have to remind ourselves, judges are not politicians. And when you talk about our values, a judge's responsibility is to follow the law or to apply the law. And yeah, is there subjectivity? Of course there is. Judges are human beings who, who have 
they're informed by their own background, right? So we have some judges, judges who come from very different backgrounds who, that inform the decisions that they make. That's actually the beauty of the judiciary, that judges can use their discretion and we can hold them accountable. We can hold them accountable by when their term is up, then if the voters say, well, we don't want you to stay on, then voters, someone can run to take that judge's seat. Although you'll note in the book, I opposed judicial elections, that whole system. I got to the Superior Court by way of an election, but I don't think it is the way that judges should be uh, placed in their positions in the judiciary. I want to go back in time to, I think it's the very first case that you heard as a pro tem judge. So maybe you can tell the story of that because we haven't heard a lot of bench anecdotes because I've not asked. And also maybe you could just briefly explain what a pro tem judge is. Sure. And there are a lot of anecdotes in there. So um, Many. Um, and they're good. Good. Um, so um, judge pro tem. Uh, from the Latin, pro tem means for the time. And so there are some courts, some counties that have a program where lawyers, after they've been lawyers for a certain number of years, can be a judge pro tem. That means a judge for a day and preside over a small claims case. Small claims, that's Judge Judy cases, right? No lawyers, people suing each other, up to a certain amount of money. So in Santa Clara County, there was a pro tem program. I got a phone call, random phone call, from a judge named Mark Thomas. I didn't know him. He eventually became a colleague of mine. And he said, I'm calling you because, can I put you on a list to be a pro tem judge? Because I'm really trying to diversify this pro tem judge program and bring in women and people of color. So. I was at the time working at Stanford. I was an assistant dean at the law school. And I said, sure, put me on the list. I had never thought about being a judge. And understand, back then, so we're talking 1980 perhaps, uh, there weren't all, the, this, all of these TV shows that have TV judges as they are today. Uh, so um, I said, OK, fine, put my name on the list. So uh, I don't know if it was a few weeks or a few months later, I get a call. And I said, your number has come up. And it's just random. And they, here's your case. So I go to the court get a robe, and uh, go in the courtroom. And who do I see? The courtroom is empty, because it's just a small claims case. This is something that you know judges, they really don't really spend their time doing. It was important to me. I am you know got the robe, and I walk in, and there are two women suing each other, sitting there in the courtroom. Both of them were black. So I'm like, oh, this is a black lady courtroom. What is this, right? So. <laughs> I will tell you that I, litig I presided over the case, I made a decision, and I won't tell you anything about that case, it's in the book. I will tell you one thing, the subject of the lawsuit was hair. Well, I'm glad that you raised that because it leads in perfectly to what I'm going to ask next, which is that we play some of the images that you put together for a PowerPoint if the AV folks are up to doing that, we can share these on the video wall. And it isn't necessarily featuring the hair of these two claimants, but it does show LaDoris Cordell's style as it evolved over the years. I think there's some cartoons here. I don't know if they're going to put, there you go. So, and it's really interesting. So it, for black women, our hair, that's it. I mean, it's like our hair is, what do you say, everything, right? It's like, it's got to, you know, the hair. Uh, I have very little now, and I don't have to think about it much. but. Um, I can pretty much tell by looking at my hair what cases I was presiding over and when. <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy, right? Um, so all kinds of things. I went from dreads to a box to this is when I started wearing straightened hair. My hair was like here, like, you know, I fling it and uh, got shorter and then and it got shorter. Um, this is when I was sworn into the in 1988 to the Superior Court after winning an election. And then the hair started getting shorter. And then shorter here, I can tell you, I was presiding in the mental health calendar over on the far left. Um, so um, yeah, it's um, a part of, and I write about it in the book. I mean, quite clearly, this is part of, of who I am. Uh, and, and I can tell you, the looks I would get walking in the courtroom, all rise, you know, I walk in and people are like, what, what the heck? And it, it's, it's, it was important, right? About busting stereotypes and letting people know that, oh, I mean, People who look like me can do this work. And the pressure was on being the first, and all of you know that. If you're the first doing something, the pressure's on. Don't mess up. And for me, with respect to communities of color, it was like, do not mess up. 
Because if you do, there probably won't be anybody around looking like you for a long time. Um, so I, again, write about all that in the book, particularly the uh, first chapter and called Bitten by the Judge Bug. I'm wondering something. Is part of it, too, that if you have to wear a black robe, you have so little way of expressing yourself? And that, because I'm noticing the, the beautiful jewelry, but it's pretty bold, and the hair is bold. I mean, you're just going there with each. And I wonder if it's, it's a way of, it's, it's the only way that you have to express yourself at work. Well, Laura, no, that was me. It's just me. You know, <laughs> I, I have this woman, Rabia, who's mentioned in the book, who, who she's taken care of my hair for 40 years. I mean, and it's just what I felt like at the moment, at the time. Uh, and I will tell you, I mean, I have two daughters, and I know that when I was wearing the box and I had a tail in the back, they're like, Mom, please, no. <laughs> no please no. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's just, no, it's who I am. But, but, you know, when you raise this other point, though, about, you know, we wear the robe, and um, we, are, we are really supposed to be poker face up there. Uh, we're not supposed to be showing, you know, what it is we're feeling or thinking. And I write in the book about that actually judicial behavior that studies have been done. And, and I really can attest to this. I was actually helped get this study and actually written about. But jurors in particular, they just stare at judges. I mean, there's people testifying, but they're looking at the judge. And if I were to just sit like this, not doodle, just sit, even though I'm poker face, judge, the jurors are really going to get a sense that I'm maybe I'm angry or maybe I think this case is really important. It's really strange. I mean, we are, I don't know what the psychological word is, but so they read us. And so it's really important that judges not roll their eyes and sit in their chair and swivel around. And I have instances in, in the book where judges did that and it ended up being caused to reverse decisions uh, to reverse convictions because judges were not doing what you know, we should do, which is, you know, we are there to make sure everything is running smoothly, but also to let the jurors decide and not, we're not the show, you know, the show happens at the witness stand and then was left to the jurors. So I have a chapter in the book called Thank You for Your Service, and it's all about juries and about jurors. Um, so, and I do have recommendations about. I was about to change. say you have some uh, you have some pretty strong feelings about how we could reform the jury system, and I think I think given how important juries are, and also how rare trials are, how disinclined people are to serve, that's worth talking about. Well, that's a lot. Um, so, <laughs> jurors. First of all, I believe in the jury system. It's it's really what keeps the legal system honest, and I really believe in them. But so, do some jurors get it wrong? Yeah. But in, in the main, I do believe in them. And I, the jurors that I have spoken to after I've presided over trials, they've loved the experience. They've really enjoyed it. Uh, so it's really important to me that people understand that jurors matter uh, because it is my experience that when my neighbors get a letter in the mail, jury duty, they call me up, how do I get out of this? It's like the plague, right? I can't go down. Well, why is that? One is that jurors sit around a lot. They know. I mean, you go down, you got to sit and you wait. You don't know what's going on in the courtroom. Um, and it's so important that people, and especially our young people coming up, understand that jury duty, it's a civic responsibility, and it's so important in our legal system. And by the way, there's no age limit, so you can be you know, older person and, and, and still be on the jury. Some people kind of think that, well, after a certain age, you can't be. That is not the case. Um, so the question comes up, and I talk about this in the book, about juror compensation. Uh, so should juries be paid? Jurors be paid. And most states pay jurors. So what's the pay in California if you're a juror? You get paid $15 a day, only starting on the second day not even on the first day of jury service. So the question is, oh, well, what, what is that? What is that? Uh, if you're a juror in the federal system, $50 a day. Some states pay nothing. New Mexico pays the minimum hourly wage. So the question becomes, and, and I've, I've, got push, I've gotten pushback on this. One school of thought is, wait a minute, it's a civic duty. You shouldn't have to be paid at all. And the other is, it's a civic duty, and you should be compensated. Uh, my view is this should be compensation, and it shouldn't be, for example, in California, $15 a day. I believe that companies like Microsoft, Google, Facebook, all the, you know, the big money, they should pay any of their employees who serve on jury duty their full salary while they're serving. 
And for companies that cannot afford to do it and only have a handful of employees, uh, my view is that there should be a state juror compensation fund that pays them what they would be making if they were working in that, in that business. And for those who are retired, people who are unemployed, there should be that they should be compensated uh, from the state juror compensation fund and maybe at you know, the, the hourly rate, the, the minimum hourly rate. Uh, so again, you might disagree with me and think that you know, there shouldn't be compensation. I, I tend to think that I think that if we want to say to jurors, jurors matter, then I think they should be compensated. I also think there's just a real economic bias that enters into it when you do not compensate. Because, of course, a lot of people can't miss work and they're not going to get paid if they do. And then you end up with a pool that is not necessarily representative of the community. I mean, I'm sure you heard many excuses from many potential jurors about why they couldn't serve some perhaps more credible than others. But one thing that people commonly say is, I simply can't afford to do this. Exactly. Um, and so we end up not with diverse jurors, and by diverse, I mean representational diversity. Uh, so we're, they're supposed to be your peers who are, are serving as jurors. And our peers really, people who all, let's say, all white jury and they're all retirees, and you have a defendant who's young and maybe a defendant of color. Um, so my concern is that we need the diversity. It's important for the jury system to be legitimate. Um, and jurors have such an important role to play in all of this, right? They are eventually the deciders. So um, I believe with the compensation that we will encourage the representational diversity uh, in our juries. So this is a question from, from the audience. And the question is this. Erlon Woods and Nigel Poor were here a couple of evenings ago. And Erlon Woods, he was formerly incarcerated. Now he's out. They have a very popular podcast called Ear Hustle. Yes. Mr. Woods spoke of his fight to repeal, not reform, but repeal the three strikes law. What are your thoughts about extremely difficult? Right. The, the three strikes law, another word, phrase for it or term for it is mandatory minimum sentencing. That's what these laws are. They take away all discretion from judges in sentencing. Sentencing is the most difficult thing that judges do because we use our discretion. We apply rules, but we have to look at so much. The victims, the circumstances of the crime, the sophistication of the defendant, the defendant's background, upbringing, education, all of that in sentencing. But mandatory minimums like the three strike take all that away. The three strikes laws, mandatory minimums, paint all defendants with the same brush. Doesn't matter where from whence they have come. If you are convicted of this crime, then away you go, and you go away for a long, long time. I write in the book in the very last chapter, um, no, next to last chapter, I write about a man named Leo Hill, whom I sentence to 55 years to life, and I did not want to do that. Um, however, I took an oath to uphold all of the laws of California, and the laws of the US Constitution. And judges, we can't pick and choose what laws we want to enforce uh, because we have taken an oath to uphold them all. And I arrived at a point where I knew that I could not uphold or enforce that draconian law. And at the time in California, the three strikes law was the harshest of all the three strikes laws that were in other states. It was the harshest because the third strike could be a non-serious, non-violent crime, such as theft or drugs. And indeed, in California, uh, we ended up with mass incarceration because of these mandatory minimum sentencing laws. The ma great majority of people serving for their, their third strike, their third strikes were non-serious, non-violent, mostly drug and theft charges. So I advocate for uh, doing away with mandatory minimums. I believe that, well, first of all, everyone's different and everyone has a story. And that doesn't mean, by the way, that judges should be, you know, you know, soft or less punitive. That's not the issue. The issue is looking at all of these factors and doing what the law says we should do and use, using our discretion in doing that. So I am opposed to mandatory minimums and I don't think, and I know because in the book I've even written, they do not, they do not reduce crime. Uh, comparisons and studies have been done in states that don't have mandatory minimums and those that do, and there is no difference. 
So it is a, it is a myth to believe that, oh, we really need them because we need to lock all these people up for a long time. Mr. Hill's t case ended up taking kind of an interesting turn. Can you talk about that? Because what you did I thought was unusual. Okay, so uh, it's, it's a little bit of a teaser. I'm not going to give the complete end of it, okay. but, I, but I will take you there. So I, I tell you this story, you know, and it broke my heart uh, to sentence Leo Hill, and then I left. I retired from the bench. So a few years later, I get a phone call from a lawyer who is representing Leo Hill on, as, on his appeal. And this lawyer says to me, you know what? I think I can get him resentenced because when you sentenced him, you made an, you made an error. There was a case that you should have known about, you didn't, which could have given you the discretion you needed to maybe sentence him to less time. So when this lawyer called me, I mean, he was clearly apprehensive about talking to me at all because I think he was imagining I was going to like, you know, get very defensive. And I said, well, what, what are you, why are you calling me? What are you asking? He says, I need you to write an affidavit, sign it under penalty of perjury that you messed up. <laughs> um, so let me just leave it there. And I want you to read about... <laughs> what my reaction and my response was and what happened thereafter to Leo Hill. This is a question I think you'll be able to answer in full. We'll is there a favorite story or thing that happened that didn't make it into your book? So something that got left on the cutting room floor. Oh my goodness. Um, so you figure over a 20 year period, maybe I presided over 10,000 cases maybe, maybe more than that. Uh, because in one morning I arraigned 300 people between 9 a.m. and noon. And by the way, I don't say that to brag. That's not justice. But that's how overcrowded uh, the courts can become uh, because we don't have enough courtrooms and enough people to, uh, um, judges and jurors and all that to, to take care of all of these cases. So if I'm, I'm trying to think of a case that I did not put in the book because there's so many. And right now I'm kind of drawing a blank. And I'm looking right at Florence, my partner, sitting in the audience. If she remember, if you remember one, let me know. Give me a signal or something. I, I the dermatologist? Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> well, let, let me, and I'll be very brief. Um, yeah, there's a case that I didn't put in there. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was a Stanford dermatologist who was charged with uh, sexual assault. And I had to preside over the preliminary hearing to determine if there was enough evidence to send the case to trial. But it really ended up being a full-blown trial in front of me. And it was fascinating because the two lawyers, that really made the thing for me. It was a real show because the lawyers were terrific. And one was about, I don't know, five foot one, and the other was about six foot four. And these two men went at it, and they were terrific. Uh, so it was a prosecutor and defense attorney, and we had all kinds of surprises in this case. We actually had a, a full-scale model of the dermatology clinic set up in the middle of the courtroom, <laughs> and we had witnesses coming in, uh, certainly the alleged victim in the case, and also the dermatologists and other doctors who testified, one of whom had a photographic memory, which was great. Um, so anyway, that was one that didn't make it in, and... Um, the outcome was, I will tell you, I did not hold the dermatologist to answer, meaning uh, I dismissed the case. I found that there was not sufficient evidence to find that he should go on to trial in the case. And I really believe I did the right thing on that one, made the right call. And I wrote a decision. It wasn't like I just said it from the bench. I actually thought about it and wrote a, what I believe a thoughtful decision, and that decision was never appealed. So it must have been right. But. <laughs> How often did you write out your decisions to explain your reasoning? Sure. Um, figure you go into a courtroom and a judge says, uh, granted or denied when your, your case is done. Um, you want to know, like, what's the reasoning? What's the basis for it? Judges don't have to do that, but we should. So whenever I could, I explained as best I could decisions that I made and were somewhere I had, say, a lengthy hearing or lengthy trial, it was just in front of me, I felt it important to write the decision 
uh, to spell out all of my reasoning. And it was really a good thing for me to do because after, if I wrote it out and read it and it didn't make sense, I knew that, wait a minute, maybe I'm going down the wrong track. So I did it pretty frequently. Although, you know, I was told when I started judging, uh, one of the old longtime judges, a good old boy, came and visited me in my chambers and he says, oh, don't write decisions out. Just, you know, just make your ruling and that's it. And I said, well, I mean, people should know. No, don't even, don't even worry about it. It takes too much time. If they don't like what you say, you know, they can just appeal it. Um, so that's advice I didn't take. Um, and he'd been on the court a long time and I guess he was tired. I don't know. Um, so, uh, yes, I try, I think it's very important for, especially, you know, our trial judges to absolutely explain exactly what it, what we have, the decisions we've made and why we have made them. This is an audience question that is very interesting to me. Why do you think people believe that compassion and mercy when expressed in the criminal justice system is a weakness? And what do you think we can do to change that perception? So I, I love the question. Um, we have become, and this is over a long period of time, a punitive society. Uh, other countries look at us and say, wow, I mean, why are people getting these really long sentences? This has become the norm in this country. And I think it's very important that we look around at what other countries do for people. I'm not talking really in the criminal side now and in sentencing people and how our sentences are grossly disproportionate to sentences that are given in, out in other courts around the, around the world. So it, it's really, you know, it, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, as long as I have lived, I just can, just can remember that this, this whole punitive nature of things. And, and in fact, judges get labeled soft if they're not really punitive. And who labels them soft? Usually it's prosecutors. So if you look at our, our system, we have prosecutors who, you know, first of all, they want to get convictions. And if they're really fighting for justice and for the people and people should be convicted, that's fine. Um, I write in the book, however, where I, I, you know, dealt with prosecutors who were really interested in getting those notches on their belts, whatever way they could do it. And, you know, one of the ways was plea bargaining. And I have a, a chapter in here um, about plea bargaining, which I think those of you who maybe haven't thought much about it will find it, I think, very fascinating and really appalling. Um, so if I can just kind of segue a I little into I was, that. I, yes, I want you to stay on that topic and talk about your relationship with plea bargaining and also your title as Queen of Pleas. Queen of Pleas, yeah. Um, plea bargaining, it's a deal. It's an agreement made between a defendant and a prosecutor, and the defendant's usually represented by an attorney. And the agreement is, I'll tell you what, plead guilty to count one, and I'll dismiss counts two, three, four, and five. So when it's time for sentencing, you know, you're only going to be sentenced on the one count and not on you know, all five, because if you go to trial and get convicted on all five, you could be going away for a longer time. So people take, defendants take deals. And in one respect, that's a good thing. If the person is committed these acts and has a way of doing shorter period of time and the prosecutor's okay with it, fine. Uh, indeed, then it clears up a courtroom and maybe, you know, clears it up so there actually can be a trial. 98% of criminal cases in the United States are settled with plea bargains. 98%. So we have 2%, about 2 or 3% that actually go to trial. So plea bargains, and there is a a passage in the book, I really want to read this to you, and it's um, by uh, Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy, and it's in the section, I, I found it, um, yeah, here it is, and this is, Associate Justice Anthony Kennedy said this in 2012, ready? Let's see, um, that's not the, the, hold on, there's another, if I start off the section with it, if you bear with me. Okay, um, and I don't want to waste a lot of time. So what he said, um, he said that it's, it's horse trading, and basically he says plea bargaining is the criminal legal system. Plea bargaining is it. So the concern I have is that the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution says everyone has a right to a jury trial all right, it, and again, with regard to criminal cases, everyone has that right, a guarantee of a jury trial. But as I told you, we don't have very many of them. And indeed, 
there's something now that's being talked about called the trial penalty. And that is, let's say you decide, oh, I don't want the plea bargain. I want to go to trial. So the case goes to a judge. The judge finds out you turned down a plea bargain, and now the judge has to preside over a trial. There's the trial penalty because judges get pissed off. And they say, I've actually heard people say, these judges will say, all right, fine. You didn't want the plea deal. You're going to go to trial here. And if you get convicted, just, you know, you're getting the max. What is that? The Sixth Amendment says there's a right to it. So that's a problem. And yet there's an even a bigger problem. And I call it in the book, The Innocence Dilemma. Henry Alford, a black man, was charged with murder. And the prosecutor wanted the death penalty. But the prosecutor offered him a plea deal and said, if you plead to second degree murder, we'll take death penalty off the table. So Mr. Alford pled to second degree murder. And after he pled and was sentenced to life, he appealed. And his appeal was this. He said, I really was forced to plead guilty. I really didn't commit this crime, but I didn't want to have the death penalty. His case went up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and we end up today with something called Alford Pleas. And an Alford plea, sanctioned by the U.S. Supreme Court, is basically you're charged with a crime. You can plead guilty to it, even though you didn't do it, because you want to avoid the risk of going to trial and getting convicted. Now, I will say with Mr. Alford, there apparently was overwhelming evidence of his guilt. But the court came out saying, with the Alford Pleas, it's fine. So we have people who are, in fact, innocent, who are pleading guilty because they don't want to take the risk of going to trial, and the U.S. Supreme Court says that's just fine. Now, not all states, I think there are three states, right, that do not have Alford pleas. They won't allow them. So we end up with the question, do we want a system that says we want to get these cases out, and even if you are innocent, we still get them out anyway, and you'll just plead. And no, I don't think so. I, I would love for the U.S. Supreme Court to re-examine its position on this. And in fact, one of the justices in the Supreme Court said, you know, if Alfred pleads, get to the point where indeed people who are in fact innocent are pleading guilty, then we need to re-examine it. So I point out in the book that it is time to re-examine because there are estimates that 1% to 2%, and that's probably low, of people who took plea bargains are in fact innocent. That's tens of thousands of people who are serving time in prison. And part of the reason we know that, and you cite to this, is that we have something called the National Registry of Exonerations, which is an organization that tracks every wrongful conviction starting in 1989. And some of these wrongful convictions, which were provable by DNA and other evidence, are the result of people actually pleading guilty. So it's, it's an empirically proven fact that this actually happens. It's not some kind of sort of theoretical thing the way arguably it might have been in the Alford case. And it's not just the judges, it's also the prosecutors who are extremely coercive in these plea bargaining situations. It's hard to imagine very many people turning down a life sentence if they're looking at the death penalty, even if they're innocent. And of course, many people on death row have been exonerated because they're innocent. Or, you know, in a recent case that we had at the Racial Justice Clinic, we had a client who insisted on his right to trial, but as a result of that, even though he was 19 and had only one nonviolent prior conviction, the prosecutors uh, triggered something called a habitual offender law, which is quite common in many states. And what that did was it took the mandatory minimum for this crime from 10 years to 50, just simply for him insisting on his right to go to trial. And then he was convicted and he got 60 years with no possibility of parole as a 19 year old. And he wrote to his pen pal, if the people were to take me to trial again, I would plead guilty even though I did not commit the crime. At the time I was thinking, 10 years seems like a long time, but the truth is I would be out by now. And as it is, I'm going to die in here. And unfortunately, that's the lesson that people take away. It's so daunting that I think you almost have to be irrational to insist on a trial even if you are innocent or you just think they can't prove it. Right, but that person you're talking about What's the ending? He's, he was exonerated. By whom? By our clinic. By you. Laura <laughs> Bazelon. That's right. But you take that you. case on, right? But I, you know, I think about I think about this case a lot, and I think about the letter that he wrote to his pen pal, Miss Karen, because 
there are so many, his name is Utico. There are so many Uticos in there. So, so, so many. And all the amount of things that had to happen for him to get to where he ended up getting were nothing short of miraculous. And most people don't have those changes in fortune and that kind of um, access and luck. And so the guilty plea system is truly, I think, coercive in a way that we almost have no understanding of, particularly when you think about these lower level offenses where people are just pleading so they can get out of jail, right, and go home. Exactly. And so in the book I do, one of the fixes is we have to stop this coercive plea bargaining. If we're going to keep plea bargaining, it, it must not be coercive. And how does that change? It's prosecutors. And how do they change? It's the leadership in the prosecutor's office who say, you know, here's the new rule. There will be no coercive plea bargaining. Um, and that's, you know, and, and it's hard because there are progressive prosecutors who are now looking at recall campaigns because they are advocating for these kinds of things where people use the words, you know, soft and, you know, it's really soft on crime. No, it's not. No, it's not. Uh, so I'm, that's why, you know, I'm, I wrote this book because it's, it's really, these things need to be said. And I saw these things firsthand and actually had to apply these things firsthand. So you asked me about the queen of pleas. Oh yeah, let me tell you, when I was on the bench and I got started, I could, I could get a plea out of anybody. <laughs> and what really is disconcerting is that when black defendants, and there were a lot of black and brown defendants coming in, they wanted to come into my court. Why? Because, you know, we looked like each other and they thought, you know, here's somebody that's going to hear me. And I did. Uh, believe me, I did. But at the same time, the pressure was on. There aren't enough courtrooms. These, you know, these people, you know, want to, who, to, to try cases. So these folks would come in and they were quite willing to listen to me. And so I could push it. I pushed the plea deals until I finally got to the case where uh, there should have been a plea deal. Uh, and I wanted the prosecutor to, to make this one that was fair. And I couldn't control the prosecutor. Prosecutors have more power than judges, by the way. They're the ones that decide what charges to file. And I couldn't. I actually begged and pleaded with the prosecutor in the case. Please, you know, you can get rid of one of these strikes here and, and this person doesn't deserve to be. Nope, didn't happen. And so I, I just felt terribly uh, about this person. I didn't end up taking his plea because I, I just wouldn't do it. Uh, and he went to trial and I don't know what happened to him, but I, you know, for a while there, early on, I mean, it really went to my head. I was getting these pleas and the judges on my court were applauding me. She is just, oh, you know, she's getting these cases out of here. We don't have to try these cases. So, you know, it took a while and, and, and I will say, you know, this is part primer, right? It's about education and about our system, but it's part memoir. And it's not worth writing a memoir unless you're going to be absolutely truthful. And that means the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? So it's in here, and I, I write it, and some of the stuff was hard to write, but it's important that you understand the kinds of things that, you know, a trial judge who really cared, and I cared, went through in order to try to do justice in my courtroom. When you read the letters that you wrote to your parents all those years later, did the portrait that you were painting of your life on the bench and all of your assignments and experiences, did that match up with your memory of it? Or reading those letters, did you realize something about your style of judging or your manner of judging or your thinking about your role that you hadn't before? I mean, one of the things that I, that I did on the bench, my decision was I wanted to be an all-purpose judge. And I wanted to just, you know, be in all these different kinds of cases, mental health calendars and probate and, and family court, all of these. So, I mean, the letters, what they did for me was they brought back home to me all the many different kinds of cases that I presided over. Because, you know, some judges just want to specialize in one thing, like juvenile law, and that's fine. But I really wanted to get a sense about everything in the system. Uh, so no, you know, when I read the letters, it didn't, it, it didn't change the, the frame. I mean, I, I, it didn't change who I thought I was. It really reinforced my, you know, my understanding about who I was when I was on the bench. And it, what, what shocked me and surprised me was just how much that I did on the bench, how many cases I presided over. One of the things that I don't think is in your book, or if it is, I missed it, is what happens in chambers and how much of the proceedings actually happen outside of 
outside of open doors, I guess is how I should put it, because there's a lot of things that go on in a judge's chambers between the lawyers and the judge, especially in state court. Yeah. So in chambers, and the chambers generally, there's a conference table, sometimes there's a couch, and then there's a desk and the chair. And what happens, say, in criminal cases, I, the lawyers, if they're trying to work out a plea deal, will sometimes come in and want to talk to me because they'll say, you know, what, what sentence will you give if the defendant pleads to this? And the defense attorney wants to know that. And then there are other things that happen in chambers. So I write, there's a chapter about adoptions. I love them. Mm. I love doing adoptions. And I would do the adoptions, call them into chambers where, you know, the kids, usually they were little kids and um, some of them, you know, would sit on my lap and it was just, just a feel good kind of love fest. Uh, so those kinds of things would happen. And then there were times when, for example, I presided over juvenile cases and not juvenile delinquency of involving crimes, but where children had been taken from their homes because they'd been abused or neglected and then they had to be placed, say, in foster care. And those conversations didn't need to be held in a, in a courtroom. And we would sit in chambers and try to figure out what would happen, you know, what should happen with these children. So there's a, like I said, there's a little bit of all of that in there. Um, the one of the things, though, I, I do want to, to let folks know is that, and, and maybe you know this, all systems resist change. I don't care if it's, you know, education, school systems, uh, you're in academia. Uh, and that same is true of the legal system. So I write in the book about efforts I made to change, to make things better. Why would I even do that, right? I mean, you're a judge, why even do it? There are only, let's just take California, there are just a handful, 1,600 judges, and that's counting appellate judges in the whole state. And we got, what, 40 million people? So these are rare opportunities to wear that black robe, particularly to be a trial court judge. And my view is every trial court judge should be an activist judge. And what do I mean by activists? I don't mean a judge that goes rogue and ignores precedent. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying that there's so many things that we can do as judges to make this system better. That's where we should be spending our time in addition to presiding over cases. But be forewarned. If you do, the system will push back. So there's a chapter in the book I write uh, where I was the first judge in the state of California to order convicted drunk drivers in my courtroom to put breath devices in their cars. And it is the story, it is a saga about what happened when one judge, my own courtroom, decided to do this and indeed sentenced more than 70 drunk drivers to put these devices in their cars. The idea is, before you can start the car, this device is about the size of a cell phone, you have to blow into it. If you have alcohol in your system, the car won't start. So you've disabled this 2,000 pound weapon. So you cannot drive it while you're under the influence. So in the book, it is a story about how the system pushed back. Uh, in fact, I had to lawyer up and uh, go to court myself in order to defend what it was I was doing. I wanna stay on that for a minute because you did a number of remarkable things as a judge in this philosophy that a judge should be, as you say, an activist in the way that you define. I think it may finally be having a little bit of a moment. This morning I read an article in the Yale Law Review, because I read law review articles, because I'm a law professor, by a sitting judge who I think is on the highest court in Michigan. And it's really about this. She's a sitting judge and she's talking about how, in her opinion, it's almost, or not almost, it is unethical to not try to reform your profession, to not try to make the system better. And you write this, you write, the courts no less than the rest of us resist change. We become so comfortable doing things one way that we fail to notice when things are not working. And I would go a step further and say, it's, it's not even that, it's the real institutionalized resistance to doing things differently, even if you know they're not working. And I'm not talking about precedent and following precedent. I'm talking about the functioning of the courts, the way people are treated, having, for example, more problem-solving courts, trying to think creatively about how to do things differently. And I think you are really on the forefront of that in a way that I'm hoping will be taking hold more, but I'm wondering what you think. Yeah, I, I'm just thrilled that there is a judge or a justice who wrote about this because I believe it is part of the essence of judging, which is what I write about. Um, and it isn't just so much you know coming up with innovation. It also means say, in sentencing, being creative and thinking outside the box. So I write in the book about two young men who came into my court who had been decided to plead guilty 
to vandalism. Uh, and what had they done? They had painted KKK on the home outside walls of a black family and burned a cross on the lawn. So imagine how they felt when they showed up in my courtroom. And I'm the only <laughs> black judge in the whole bench at the time. They got me. Um, so I, again, it's very important, pull back. You know, you don't do things in anger in life in general, and certainly not on the bench, right? Um, so when they came back for sentencing, um, I could have sentenced them to jail. They had no prior criminal history. But I did something creative. You know, I sentenced them to go to school. I found a nearby community college that had an evening seminar class for an entire semester on uh, things racial. I, I don't know what it was. Um, and, and I said, here's your choice. You, know, you can go to jail and you know, sit there for a month, cool your heels, or you can take this class. And all you have to do for me is pass it. You can give me a C, and then you, know, you have to write an essay. And of course they did. And what is the subject? Martin Luther King Jr., of course. Right? <laughs> um, but they did, you know, and they came back to court uh, afterwards, and I think more mature and more thoughtful. And so some people would say, ah, soft on crime, you should you know, lock them up, and, and I, I strongly disagree. And that's the beauty of trial court judges. Why, you know, we're on the front line and why it's so important for you, all of us, to know who they are and understand their backgrounds, why they're there, and be very thoughtful when these names appear on the ballot, when you get your ballot, because I'll tell you, I get phone calls the night before, oh, there's somebody on the ballot here, do you know anything about this judge? They're going, no, 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 no. I mean, we need to take this very, very seriously and understand how, how it all works. Agree. And now we are down to the Commonwealth Classic, which is the official rap question. You've asked it of other people, now it's your turn in the hot seat. What is your 60-second idea to change the world? Voting. I want every single person, not just register to vote, and those of you who are turning 18, make that your birthday present to yourself, register to vote. Not only do that, but vote. Don't complain. Don't complain to me or anybody if you don't vote. You have no right and I say to people who are like, well, oh, I don't know if I'm going to vote. All of us in this room, I don't care what your background is, we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. And I will tell you, some of those who came before us look like me, who were my ancestors who sacrificed and died so that everybody could have access to the ballot. And you see what's happening today, right? <laughs> Voter suppression trying to keep us away. We must stand firm because once you have the power of the vote, you have the power to change everything for the better in this country. Thank you so much to Judge LaDoris Cordell for joining me and all of you today at Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. I just want to remind our audience that the book, Her Honor, My Life on the Bench, What Works, What's Broken, and How to Change It can be purchased here on site or through your preferred bookseller. However, I suggest you do it here because Judge Cordell will be signing copies of the book in just a few minutes right outside these doors. Finally, if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts to make virtual and in-person programming this year, please visit the commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Laura Bazelon. Thank you so much and stay safe. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Awesome.